Hi, welcome to Life is Spiritual Presents The Antichrist Agenda with Climate Change. This is a video about how the Antichrist will utilize the agenda of climate change. Now, we in no way are not saying that climate change is false. We do not and will not disagree with or contradict well-established scientific consensus around the existence and causes of climate change. And so we just wanted the YouTube community to know that so they don't cancel this video. There, now that that's out of the way, let us analyze how the Antichrist will consolidate worldwide power partly through the agenda of climate change. 1 Timothy 6, 9. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to your trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. First of all, let's define climate change according to the United Nations. And I quote, climate change refers to long-term shifts in temperatures and weather patterns. These shifts may be natural, but since the 1800s, human activities have been the main driver of climate change, primarily due to the burning of fossil fuels like coal and oil and gas, which produces heat-trapping gases." End quote. By saying that the world's temperature is increasing, Western governments can implement guidelines that force smaller countries to adopt policies that benefit larger economies at the expense of smaller ones. This keeps the economies of the world headed in the general direction that the world's economic and banking elite wanted. It must be understood that the world's international financial system is a system of economic slavery and financial exploitation. The economies of African nations as well as other non-white nations or brown nations have been turned into extraction economies where Western multinational corporations extract the wealth from black and brown nations while further enriching themselves at the expense of the nations of the world. James chapter 5 from verse 1 to verse 8 explains the central banking financial system of this world beautifully. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of your laborers, who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, cries, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and have been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. James chapter 5 from verse 1 to verse 8. That scripture encapsulates the financial system of this world, the banking system, the international central banking system of this world. It is a system of exploitation. And that's just the reality of it. It doesn't mean that, it, that the ones who, or the people who participate in it are all evil, no, but the system itself, fractional reserve banking, it is a system of exploitation that is designed to print money and to lend it to governments and lend it to humanity from central banks. And so every bill you see is a debt and every single coin you see is a debt which must be repaid with interest. So every time they print a single coin or a single dollar or a single shilling or a single pound or a single euro, it is a debt 
that must be repaid with interest, except the interest has not been printed. So you never escape this debt cycle, this ruthless cycle of debt. And that's why it is a system of exploitation. That is what the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund is doing. They implement systems of economic enslavement, also called debt, on black and brown nations while exploiting their human and natural resources. If their leaders have integrity and refuse to sell their citizens into debt slavery, the IMF or the World Bank will just sponsor their political opponents. This usually leads to political instability or even government coups that topple democratically elected presidents and replace them with puppets who are more, shall we say, cooperative or amenable to reason. For anyone who would like to fully understand how this works, please read a book written by author and whistleblower John Perkins called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. He would negotiate deals on behalf of the World Bank which would put third world countries with natural resources like oil or gas or mineral deposits in mountains of debt in exchange for development projects which would benefit U.S. corporations like Brown and Root or Bechtel and Halliburton. The money would go to these corporations and the developing country would get these massive projects in exchange which would really only benefit the wealthiest people in that country while leaving the vast majority of their citizens in mountains of debt. Since bad management is always an issue in developing countries, these governments would miss their debt payments and the result would be the surrendering of their most prized natural resources to pay off the debt. This ruthless cycle of economic enslavement would often leave a trail of destruction and political chaos in its wake. I stood in front of the Shah of Iran, the presidents of Indonesia, Ecuador, Panama, members of the Royal House of Saudi Arabia, and I've said something like, in this hand, I have millions of dollars for you and your friends if you play our game. In this hand, I have a gun in case you decide not to. Now, my words were more diplomatic than that, but that was the message. I was an economic hitman. And we economic hitmen have created a new global economy, really, a form of capitalism that I call predatory capitalism. It isn't working. We all know this. The oceans are rising. The glaciers are melting. Less than 5% of us live here in the United States and we consume almost 30% of the world's resources, while half the world is on the verge of starvation, or actually starving. The first time we see slavery in the Word of God is when Pharaoh of Egypt imposed slavery upon the children of Israel as a strategy to combat their numbers. Exodus chapter 1, from verse 5 to verse 11. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. For Joseph was in Egypt already, and Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falls out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters, to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pitham and Ramses. Exodus chapter 1 from verse 5 to verse 11. I would dare to say that even the major cities of our time, Western cities, have been built on the backs of slavery. This is Pharaoh's design. Pharaoh was the first one 
to create an economic system of slavery that was used to build cities. He pioneered that philosophy and that way of thinking. Pharaoh's pioneered strategy of population control through economic enslavement was a first, but that system of economic enslavement and population control has been used until this day. And as we proceed through this documentary, you will see Pharaoh in every system of the world. Pharaoh showed the current leaders of this world how to control the children of God while profiting from their collective efforts. Pharaoh was the master builder, the master manipulator, the Freemason that showed all of the modern day Freemasons how to enrich oneself at the expense of others. Pharaoh, a sorcerer, so in league with the marine kingdom that God instructed Moses to meet Pharaoh early in the morning at the banks of the river Nile. Not because Pharaoh would be there taking his morning shower, but because Pharaoh would be there worshiping the gods of the marine kingdom who had given him his throne, his position, and great power over all of the land of Egypt. If you look at the Egyptian pyramid, with the so-called all-seeing eye on top of it enshrined as a hieroglyph on the US $1 bill, you can easily understand that Pharaoh might have died thousands of years ago, but his system and legacy of oppression and subjugation lives on. Their goals are clearly written on their US currency. Below the pyramid, Novus Ordo Seclorum, which is Latin for New Secular or Godless Order a godless order away from the control or influence of God. The words above the pyramid read in Latin also, Anuit Coptus, which means he is pleased with our progress thus far, or he views our collective efforts with favor. So the entire symbol means he, who is Satan, is pleased with humanity's collective efforts to move the nations of the world into a new world order far away from the influence or the intervention of God. But who is he? Who is this who would be pleased with such an order of nations? He is Satan, previously known as Lucifer, the God of this world, the Pharaoh of this age, Satan, the master manipulator, the accuser of the brethren, the deceiver of nations, the cruel taskmaster, whom Jesus defeated on the cross of Calvary, having taken the authority which Satan had taken from Adam, the first man who fell and then gave the church authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of this same devil. This same devil maneuvered his way into the control of the international banking system by taking control of the US Federal Reserve Bank in 1913. Ever since then, the world has plunged deeper and deeper into debt. Please keep this economic system of debt and economic imperialism in mind as we journey into the very lucrative and profitable world of climate change. Whenever the media or politicians discuss climate change, they always stick to a pre-planned script with certain keywords which they continuously repeat in an effort to program the minds of the masses into thinking the way they want them to think. One of the phrases which they will repeat over and over is that this is the hottest year on record, on record. Remember the term on record. It will all make sense in a few minutes. You see the phrase on record only references the last 150 years of climate data. If one looks at that graph, the temperature is indeed increasing. But 150 years is just a small fraction of the total time man has been on the earth. Let us look beyond 150 years for a clearer perspective on how temperatures on earth have always fluctuated over time. Furthermore, the earth itself is far older than man. God created the earth long before he had created Adam. In fact, God commanded Adam to replenish the earth, 
which indicates that before Adam there was a population of beings on the earth, and knowing the righteousness of God, that population had been judged and wiped out of existence for their unrepentant iniquity. And Adam was their replacement, whom God commanded to populate the earth once again. So the graph which shows temperatures, which fluctuate continuously over thousands of years, is taken away and replaced with a graph which shows temperatures escalating over the last 150 years. This can also be understood by looking at the stock market. If you look at the trading activity of just one day, you would think that the market is going to crash at any moment. But if you back up and look at the entire market over an extended period of time, you can see that the market has actually been improving and that there's no cause for fear. This is just an example, not a prediction of the future of the actual stock market. So climate change is happening. It's just that what the mainstream media will not tell you is that this climate fluctuation has been taking place over and over for thousands of years. When Pharaoh starts using his media to talk about science and why the world should see things his way, you need to know that you are being set up for total economic enslavement. Climate change means more profits for them, but it means slavery for you. You will be charged for exhaling carbon dioxide. You will be charged more for what they will call excessive movement or too much travel. You will be charged for eating too much meat or eating meat at all. You will be charged for using extra electricity even though you already pay for your electricity. Your carbon footprint will be measured and calculated and you will be charged accordingly. A carbon footprint is defined as the total amount of greenhouse gases including carbon dioxide and methane that are generated by our actions as human beings. The climate change agenda will make the super rich even super richer. Your personal footprint includes emissions from a variety of sources. Your daily commute, the food you eat, the clothes you buy, everything you throw away, and more. The larger your footprint, the heavier the strain on the environment, they say. So they are placing more value on the earth and less value on humanity and using humanity's way of life to impose oppressive policies which are designed to completely subjugate and enslave humanity to a financial system that was first implemented by Pharaoh, king of Egypt, in an effort to reduce the population and use the resources and the people as in the children of Israel as a means to build cities for Pharaoh. And the pretext for this satanic agenda is saving the world or saving the environment. This will all be made possible through technology. They will track your every move. Your freedoms and civil liberties are being taken away while you watch. At Billion Consumers, we're developing through technology an ability for consumers to measure their own carbon footprint. What does that mean? That's where are they traveling? How are they traveling? What are they eating? What are they consuming on the platform? So individual carbon footprint tracker. Mm. Stay tuned, we don't have it operational yet, but this is something that we're working on. Notice how they call all human beings consumers. They have no respect for humanity. To them, all a human being is, is a consumer, almost like a rodent or an insect. Furthermore, the science behind their strategy to charge the whole of humanity money for living and breathing is also suspicious. PayPal founder Peter Thiel explains their science a bit better in this clip. Um, you know, you use science, when you use the word science, um, it, it's often a tell like in poker that you're bluffing and that no science at all is going on. And so we have political science, we have social science, we don't have physical science or chemical science, they're just physics and chemistry, there's no debate. Library um, science. <laughs> and, uh, and so if you think about other areas where people use the word science excessively, I think uh, those are areas that uh, we should perhaps be a lot more skeptical. In 1974, 
Time magazine actually published an article about another ice age where they claimed that the climate scientists had actually discovered evidence that the earth was cooling and that we could be entering into another ice age. Then one year later, Newsweek publishes an article called The Cooling World, calling it science. The whole world was supposed to be frightened into believing that we would starve to death because the world was going to get too cold. And now, just a few years later, the scientific world is headed in the complete opposite direction. All it took was a few random scientists and former U.S. Vice President Al Gore, and suddenly the news are full of stories about heat waves and droughts and powerful hurricanes. They threatened that the food supply would deteriorate and worldwide starvation would be the result, and that humanity was on the brink of annihilation, and if we did not do what they said, we'd all be dead. You see, if you keep on telling the public that you are going to suffer and die, suffering and death will enter into their minds and hearts, and then suffering and death will manifest itself. Not because suffering and death was actually coming, but because mankind had been meditating on the idea of suffering and death until the event actually came to pass. If man believes in his own destruction, he will manifest the destruction on himself. Man will have what man believes. The primary product being sold to humanity here is fear. Fear itself can produce a climate over man that can bring man into a state of self-destruction. Fear is perverted faith. In 1 John 4.18, the Bible says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. Fear is the belief that evil is coming and that it will prevail. Faith is the opposite. Faith is the belief that what God said is true and acting on those words brings what we believe into reality. By around the year 2000, the term global warming started losing popularity. It was replaced by the term climate change. The term has mutated through politicians and climate scientists into climate crisis and climate emergency. An emergency which we must take drastic action for in order to prevent our imminent destruction. Stop taking flights, they say. The carbon dioxide emissions is destroying the world. But garbage landfills produce the same amount of emissions as the entire aviation industry. And none of the news networks or politicians are saying anything about not throwing out our trash. Stop driving your cars, they say. The carbon dioxide emissions are too high. Meanwhile, cats and dogs around the world produce more carbon dioxide than all the vehicles in the world combined. Nobody's saying we need to genocide our domestic animals, even though our pets are supposedly going to pass gas into oblivion. Houses, shipping vessels, military equipment, and military vehicles produce a staggering amount of carbon dioxide. Yet no nation on the earth is willing to be homeless or give up their military. Scientists know this. But if they are going to keep getting the funding they need for their research, they have to keep producing scientific reports that keep the river of money flowing in their direction. And unless humanity can create a machine that can cool the entire earth, there's basically nothing we can do about the climate. Have a look at former U.S. President Al Gore's presentation of the climate change narrative. All this time, you can see what I have seen all these years. It just keeps going up. It is relentless. And now we're beginning to see the impact in the real world. This is Mount Kilimanjaro more than 30 years ago and more recently. And a friend of mine just came back from Kilimanjaro with a picture he took a couple months ago. Another friend, Lonnie Thompson, studies glaciers. Here's Lonnie with a last sliver of one of the once mighty glaciers. Within the decade, there will be no more snows of Kilimanjaro. In 2013, climate change investment totaled about 360 billion US dollars worldwide. At that time, the Climate Policy Initiative postulated that we would need five trillion US dollars just to produce clean energy. And if five trillion is spent by someone, then five trillion is earned by someone else. The question is, who is this someone else? 
After promoting the global warming narrative to a fever pitch using his vice presidential position in office, Al Gore started a hedge fund in 2004 called Generation Investment Management. Generation Investment Management is a hedge fund that invests renewable technology. Renewable energy technologies is an umbrella term that stands for energy production using a renewable energy resource like solar, wind, water, hydro, and tidal, biomass, biofuels and waste, and geothermal heat. By 2017, he had amassed around $200 million. This is because the total return on renewable energy has been 367% higher than fossil fuels. Al Gore publicized a perceived problem and provided the solution in order to make a fortune. Al Gore made around 100 million US dollars selling a TV channel to a company which is owned and controlled by the government of Qatar. Qatar is a Gulf nation that makes nearly all of its wealth from oil, which are fossil fuels. Al Gore did not seem to care about the effects of greenhouse gases when there was $100 million on the table for him to pocket. U.S. President Joe Biden pledged to spend $369 billion on climate and energy funding. The more money the U.S. spends on climate change, the more money opportunists like Al Gore stand to make. Even though there is no proof that renewable energy actually does anything to stop climate change. Germany spent $580 billion on renewable energy, but that did nothing to change how much greenhouse gas they emitted. So the climate scientists keep publishing climate change research to keep the money flowing from governments and corporations, which keep putting money, more and more money, into renewable energy projects, which essentially does nothing to reduce greenhouse emissions. Proverbs 14 verse 12 says, There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the climate industrial complex the racket of making money off of the perceived fears of the general public. Proverbs 29 verse 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoso puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. By the way, the U.S. and the Norwegian governments didn't seem to care much about carbon dioxide emissions when they blew up Russia's Nord Stream gas pipelines to Europe. Europe will now be supplied with gas coming from the U.S. and Norway. Modeling showed that the explosions led to the release of between 56,000 and 155,000 tons of methane, resulting in the world's biggest single leak of methane gas. According to calculations by the agency, the leaks in the pipelines connecting Russia with Germany that were found earlier that week might lead to methane emissions with a climate-damaging effect equivalent to 7.5 million tons of CO2. The deception that becoming a vegetarian and driving an electric car will reduce our carbon footprint is all part of the climate industrial complex, a money-making racket that keeps the super rich rich and the poor super poor. Let me show you how it works. Let's say you are the United States of America. In order to become the superpower that you are, you pass through something called the Industrial Revolution an era of manufacturing and productivity that also left a trail of environmental destruction in your wake. Europe and America had the Industrial Revolution powered by coal. Coal which pumped millions of tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. But this Industrial Revolution made you filthy rich in the process. All of those emissions in the US and Europe translated into trillions of dollars. All you had to do was count the money while third world countries did all the hard work for you. The rich got richer and the poor got poorer. But these poor countries are getting smarter. They don't want to remain poor. They're realizing that they don't have to stay poor and that they can also get rich if they jump onto the industrialization train. But the West can't allow that. If the poor countries get rich, who will do all the hard work? How will we enslave them with debt if they don't need to borrow? How will we threaten them if they develop their own industries, their own military, and their own nuclear weapons? How can we keep them poor without actually looking like we're keeping them poor? Well, since they're trying to industrialize, and industrialization causes CO2 emissions, let's criminalize CO2 emissions and create policies that force developing countries to reduce their emissions to zero or else. No more aid. 
At the UN Conference for Climate Change in 2021, all the rich countries of the world got together to decide who's to blame for climate change. They decided to point the finger at India and China and persuade them not to use any more coal. But this would bring all of their factories to a grinding halt. There's no way they would agree to commit economic suicide. They agreed to a partial reduction, but we know that's all talk and no action. Rich countries are not pulling their weight. They promise to fund the transition to clean fuels, but they're not putting their money where their mouth is. Rich countries drove climate change. Now they want to end it, but they don't want to pay for it. They want the developing world to foot the bill. And that is the crux of the problem. Who will pay the money? Where will the money come from? Rich countries have failed to live up to their promises, and I will show you how. At COP15 in the year 2009, rich countries made a pledge. They promised to provide $100 billion every year to create a climate aid fund of sorts, $100 billion every year, something that would help the world adapt to climate change, that would help other countries transition to cleaner sources of energy. That was the promise 12 years ago. We are in 2021 now and forget about paying $100 billion every year. Rich countries can't even pay their own share. Every year they fall short. Take the United States for instance, going by one estimate, it should be paying 40 to 47 billion of the $100 billion fund. How much does it pay? Between 2016 and 2018, the US contributed around 7.6 billion. 7.6, where it was supposed to pay 40. How do the others fare? By 2018, Australia had paid less than 1 billion, Canada 1.5 billion, Italy 2.3 billion, and the United Kingdom 4 billion. Look at these graphs carefully. These countries are contributing way less than what they were supposed to. Do you know how much India alone needs in climate financing by 2030? $1 trillion. What about Africa? $1.3 trillion. Do you see the gap? The developing world needs trillions of dollars to fight climate change, but the rich countries offer $100 billion and don't even pay that. And these are the countries that historically caused climate change. Some of them still remain the biggest emitters. Australia, for instance, it has the highest per capita coal emissions in the world. An average Australian emits five times more CO2 from coal than any other person in the world. The United States is close behind. It has the fourth highest coal emissions per capita in the G20. An American emits three times more CO2 than the global average. So rich countries emit more CO2 from coal than the rest of the world. They refuse to provide funding and they blame others for watered down deals. That's climate politics for you. The U.S. is 5% of the world's population, but still uses 25% of the world's resources. U.S. outsources production to China and then accuses China of carbon pollution. Any country that increases manufacturing will increase carbon pollution. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wickedness. This is how the rich Western governments are enslaving the poor. They impose burdens on the others, which they themselves are unwilling to carry. Jesus accused the Pharisees of this very thing in Matthew chapter 23, verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Of course, Jesus was talking about the Pharisees, but the concept is the same. The same spirit of Pharaoh was operating in the Pharisees during Jesus' day, and this same Pharaoh philosophy is at work today, enslaving the nations of the world. Pharaoh has become more sophisticated in his approach to systemic oppression. He has established colonial structures and institutions which exert pressure on smaller governments to play their game or else. Climate change has become a geopolitical weapon against the poor nations of the world. If we stop our greenhouse emissions, our industries grind to a halt. We lay off employees, we stop productivity, and fall back into the cesspit of poverty. Climate change gives rich countries the assumed moral authority to control poor countries. They can punish businesses they don't like and promote businesses they do like. You can regulate citizens, reduce their meat consumption by force. 22 U.S. Democrats hailed as environmental champions have personally invested in companies that rely on fossil fuels like ExxonMobil and Chevron. Now we can see how climate scientists get paid from this agenda. 
how former U.S. President Al Gore and other opportunists made a fortune, and how Western governments benefit both inside and outside the U.S. by exercising power over smaller economies. But there's still one question. What is the average person in America or Europe who protests about climate change and spends all their time and resources fighting get out of this? What's in it for them? The religion of climate change. In 1882, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche wrote something that shocked and angered the whole world. He said, God is dead. Satan had cleverly painted a picture of a monster and called it the church. Europe had had enough and was sick and tired of religion. It had become an oppressor. It had become Pharaoh and people were tired of it. They desperately wanted freedom, even if it meant the death of the idea of God. Now Nietzsche said back in the 18, late 1800s that after he said that God was dead and that people had killed him and that we'd never find enough water to wash away the blood. It's a paraphrase, but I've, I've got the basic message right. And he also said, there'll be two consequences of that. Nihilism, because there's no transcendent meaning, and a move to totalitarianism because people can't tolerate nihilism. And he said the most likely pathway to totalitarianism would be communism, essentially. He didn't quite use those words, but he meant that. He, the words are close enough. Uh, he said socialism, but I'm going to use communism to distinguish it, distinguish it from democratic socialism. And he said that probably tens of, hundred, tens of millions of people would die in the 20th century as we played out that experiment. If man does not look to God for guidance, he will set his affections on another God and open the door to the destroyer. We have already made it plain in our fellowships. When man enters into sin, he becomes food for the serpent. Psalms chapter 10, verse 4, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Psalms chapter 2, from verse 1 to verse 5, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. You know, this scripture really explains the new world order and the system of international banking that is driving humanity towards destruction. The religion of the Western governments is not Christianity. It is Freemasonry, the Antichrist religion which Cain pioneered. Nimrod played a role in it, but Pharaoh perfected it. It is the art of using sorcery to bring about a desired end. He understood how witchcraft could be used to manipulate masses of people and drive them in any direction. This is the operation of the spirit of Antichrist at work. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, the Bible says, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Daniel 8 was speaking about the Antichrist, that the Antichrist will implement policies, policies which he will use to oppress humanity. And the Bible says that craft will prosper in his hand. What kind of craft? Which craft? Sorcery will prosper in his hand. When humanity closes the door to God, they open the door to the darkness of evil they never imagined possible. When God is pushed out of the hearts and minds of men, the power vacuum of nihilism is filled with totalitarianism and communism and fascism is the result. It is the foolish and idiotic dethroning of God from the hearts and minds of men and the enthroning of the totalitarian communist, psychopathic dictator who will thrash them to pieces because that is the office which God has given him. 
Satan has been given the duty of garbage disposal. Anyone who turns their back on God and cannot see far enough to recognize the futility of life without God and the result of eternal separation from God or their need for a redeeming savior will be handed over to the garbage disposal unit called Satan and hell will be their portion until death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. Anyone who cannot be honest enough with themselves about the fallen nature of man and the debt that man owes to a just God for sin and then rejects the perfect sinless sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross has chosen to embrace the monster and the monster will be their portion. The symbols on the US $1 bill are symbols of Pharaoh, symbols of absolute totalitarian communism and the worst nihilistic fascism. You might not agree with this, but just watch and see where the world is headed and where the US economic crash leads humanity and you will understand that this has been the plan of the world ruling elite for many years. The average American had no idea and was largely unaware of the meaning of the symbols immortalized on their currency. When the Bible speaks of the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 11, from verse 37 to verse 38, the Bible says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. You see, the Antichrist Pharaoh who is coming is described perfectly in Daniel chapter 11. This Pharaoh will not regard the God of his fathers, meaning that the various religions of the world are all against homosexuality, Catholicism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islam all frown on homosexuality. But this Pharaoh shall not regard those gods, and he will not desire women. But instead, he will uphold witchcraft and use force to superimpose his policies while rewarding those that accept the LGBTQ plus philosophies with gold and silver and precious stones, meaning he will give them power to hunt down everyone who opposes LGBTQ and make them deny Jesus Christ or be killed in the most brutal, totalitarian and authoritarian form of absolute communism that the world has ever seen. Revelation chapter 13 from verse one. And the Bible says, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth 
and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beasts, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Three score is sixty, because one score is twenty, so three score is sixty. So six hundred three score and six is six hundred and sixty-six, or six six six. And the geometric representation of six 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 is the hexagram. Anyone who truly understands the symbolism on the U.S. $1 bill and has read Revelation chapter 13 knows that all hell is going to be released onto the earth. That the symbolism on the hieroglyph located on the U.S. $1 bill mean a world of godlessness and totalitarianism and dictatorship of the most brutal and grotesque dystopian control that man has ever witnessed. The sea or the waters of the earth are where abundance and economic power are controlled from. Financial terminology is always referred to with watery vocabulary, such as cash float or loan sharks or frozen assets or cash flow. Even the sides of a river are called the river banks. They are banks because they control the flow of currency. The central banks of the world are controlled by the marine kingdom, and since the banks control finance, they also control politics. So the beast which comes out of the water in Revelation chapter 13 verse 1, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, is a political system. The crowns represent kingly or governmental authority. The horns represent political power and the heads represent ten different kings or world leaders which are all representatives of the same beast or the same political system. The name of blasphemy written on their heads means that LGBTQ is accepted in their nations and promoted and given preferential treatment. This beast system is powered by the spirit of Antichrist and the dragon which is Satan is the one who gives it power and a seat of political influence and authority over people. That gross darkness is coming according to Isaiah 60. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 2. When men turned their backs on God and looked to Hitler, Mussolini, Lenin or Mao, the result was the death of over 100 million people. And man is right back in that same position. The thought of God is being removed from their minds. Satan has been hard at work removing God from every institution which men have created and replacing the Bible with philosophies that enthrone the powers of darkness in the hearts and minds of men. Climate change offers another God, Mother Nature. Climate change offers another path to salvation, sustainability and green energy. Climate change is dogmatic and demands human participation. Do not eat meat, do not burn fossil fuels, do not take flights, do drive electric cars, do walk or take public transportation, do save energy at home, etc. And other dogmatic doctrines which does not accomplish anything towards preventing climate change in the end, but only further consolidates more power in the hands of an elite few. Climate change supposedly offers a heroic opportunity to its participants, 
Oh, we saved the planet. So the assumption here is that Jesus did not save us. We saved us. Climate change threatens destruction if man does not bow down and worship him. Turn from your wicked everyday human ways or die, climate change says. Climate change is a god, and men like Al Gore and Elon Musk are his prophets. Climate change suggests that we should use electric vehicles like Tesla's, but Tesla and other electric car batteries need cobalt, which is mined in Africa and shipped by sea in ships that produce greenhouse gas emissions all over the world and all the way to the factories where more carbon emissions are produced. So the hypocrisy is astounding. In Job chapter 15, verse 43, the Bible says, For the congregation of hypocrites shall be desolate, and fire shall consume the tabernacles of bribery. Revelation chapter 13 speaks not only of a financial system, but also of a point system, a social system that gives you points based on your behavior. So if you even tweet anything that is against the government or against the order of the day, you can lose your points. Or worse still, you can have your money deducted from your digital currency account. The government can just hit a button and switch off your funds. You can lose anything, everything in a moment. This, this is the very real dystopian future which is coming. The social credit system or social scoring system, similar to what is already at work in China right now. They have a system where if you cross the street in the wrong area, your picture will be posted and you'll be on the wall of shame. They can reduce your points. And if your points get too low, there's some areas you can't even travel to. You can't get on the train. You might not be able to catch a flight. Such a social scoring system is how the governments of the world, which will become one according to the word of God, will grade people. So now even your carbon footprint will be measured. If you drive too far or if you produce too much carbon, you can be penalized. In other words, they're going to use technology to lock down the whole world. And that mark of the beast, it shows that this is an economic system. It is a social credit scoring system. It is a total dystopian big brother watching 24-7, 365 system of absolute oppression that is coming upon the earth. And climate change is a part of that system because climate change is what they're using to measure your carbon footprint. Your carbon footprint is how much carbon dioxide you produce or how well you cooperate with the climate change policies of how human beings should produce smaller and smaller amounts of carbon to, or carbon dioxide. So it's just an oppressive system. It is designed to oppress. It is designed to maximize control in the hands of a few. Elon Musk seems to be among the financial beneficiaries of climate change. Few people seem to be in a better position to benefit financially as the world turns to electric vehicles more than him. As a result of this position, Elon has become one of the wealthiest men in the world. Elon Musk is from a very privileged background. His father, Errol Musk, was a very wealthy South African property developer, developing properties like Emerald Mines. He's originally from South Africa and had a nanny who took care of him when his family moved to the United States by the name of Rosemary, who is now in her 50s. Rosemary is a born-again Christian now, and she tells a story about how Elon opened a portal in his bedroom when he was only seven years old and called her to his bedroom to meet his friends where she was sucked into a portal. There were beings on the other side who looked like the gods of Egypt with angelic bodies and heads of various animals. One of them grabbed her, but this is how she explains it. God bless you. I am Shalom Girl on YouTube. Um, I love Jesus, Jesus Christ, he saved me. I want to tell you something. 
I'm an old lady, kind of. I'm 55. I was born in San Francisco in 1965. When I was a girl, I was in San Francisco. I was procured and sent to work for a family. There were three generations. There was a boy, the boy's mother, and the boy's grandfather. They were coming from Africa. They were white as me. I thought they'd be black. They were coming from Africa. And um, because of something the boy did, I never told what he did. The boy did something very dark when he was very little. And I was just coming to know Jesus. And Jesus saved me. And um, anyway, the boy did something very dark. And I never told him what he did. And then one day I asked someone in the circle, Imelda, Joaquin's mother. I asked Imelda, I said, is he the Antichrist? I was 13 years old. She didn't even blink. She said, no, but he will present the mark. And when you see him do that, the Antichrist will take the stage. God bless you. This is Shalom Girl on YouTube. Here's a picture of me when I was a young girl. When I first escaped uh, the Illuminati. I've been telling you about a little boy that I was procured to a family of three generations and I've been telling you about the little boy whose name was El El Yon which in Hebrew means God, God Most High. It's in Genesis. And it's one of God's secret names. Now Jesus is God, so let's just make that clear. And in Luke 21 verse 8, Jesus says, Be ye not deceived, many will come in my name. Go ye not after them. The time draws near. Paraphrased. So, Jesus warns us that many are going to come in his name. Time's getting close. Don't go after them. And I'm telling you that there was a little boy with one of God's secret names. Now, I told you I was going to tell you his real name. What he did that was so dark. And I want to end this with scripture. So, the little boy's real name is, the world knows him as Elon Musk. His name changed over time. And what he did was, one day we were alone. I was watching him. I'm a few years older than him. He was born in 1965. He was tiny as a two-year-old, tiny as a two-year-old when he was supposed to be eight or so, but, um, or seven, he called me in his room. He said, Moon, come play with my friends. I'm going to attempt to tell you this story without explaining myself too much. <laughs> he called me Moon, and he said, Moon, come play with my friends. I went to the um, entry of his d doorway, and um, it was dark in there. And he'd set up some of his mother's ancient artifacts in a certain way on his bed. Well, something was happening, and there was wind and energy and sparks, and he started jumping up and down like a little kid with a sparkler on 4th of July. And something was happening, and he started being lifted up. Um, something opened up above his bed, above where he'd set this up. Something opened up, and you could see another world, and he was being lifted up, and... I grabbed his little arm and I was being lifted up and we got sucked in there and um, biblically I think it was the abyss in Revelation 10 the abyss I think that's where we were and we went in there and there was no bottom and it was dark but it was glowing and there were some creatures in there that were huge and they weren't creepy glorious and beautiful uh, to behold but we got sucked in and we were up and one of them 
grabbed me by the throat. And Elon was so happy. Um, he was so happy. And this thing grabbed me by the throat and was going to consume me. And I cried out to Jesus. I cried, Jesus, save me. And it stopped. And we flew back and we rolled out of his room and into the living room. And I was hugging the carpet, reeling from what just happened. And Elon looked up at me and he, he, he rolled out with me and we're right there face to face, like on the ground, like we were both looking at an ant or something. And he looked up at me and he, he was very surprised. And he said, Moon, why are you not like my friends? So I told you I would tell you who that little boy was and what he did. It was so dark. Elon Musk tried to sacrifice me to his friends and he opened the gateway to the abyss when he was a little boy. And Jesus, those creatures in there, um, they are subject to Jesus' name. And I thank God for saving me. Thank you, Jesus. So that's the truth. Now, as young as I was, they needed my consent for some reason or they always asked it, even though I was procured to them, even though I was created for this purpose. And at least in their minds, what the devil meant for evil, God used for good. Rosemary also asked the head mother of the Santeria cult if Elon was the Antichrist. She said that he was not, but that he will present the mark of the beast. And when we see him do that, the stage will be set and the Antichrist will make his entrance onto the world stage. Elon also has a space program with rockets and space shuttles, which also contribute to the deception of the globe and the shape of the earth. And for those who might not know what I'm talking about, please check out the alien deception part one, and you'll see what the word of God has to say about the creation of the earth, about how God created the heavens and the earth, how God also created the firmament that covers the earth. And above the firmament, there are waters. The firmament is a dome. It is firm. So there's only so high you can go. Now, if the firmament covers the entire earth, you can only imagine how high this dome is. Inside of the firmament, there are stars. Inside of the firmament, there is the sun that is traveling in its circuit over the earth. And then there's the moon. In other words, the word of God has a completely different description of how God created the heavens and the earth. And it is very different than what science falsely so-called tells you. So there is a clashing between the Bible and the scientific consensus of how the earth looks. And so it is important that Christians know this so that you read the Bible for yourself and then you make a informed decision whether you are going to stand with the Bible or you are going to stand with what is commonly referred to as scientific consensus. Either way, you're going to have to make a choice. And these choices are going to become more and more clear as governments continue to head towards the direction of one centralized worldwide government. We're going to continue seeing tremors in the financial system like the recent falling of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank and other banks. And we're, what we're seeing now is just tremors. Um, there's going to be a complete collapse of the financial system. And it is going to be replaced with digital currency. And they are going to cause the problem and they are going to provide the solution for the problem they caused. And this is all planned and this is all a part of their grand strategy to introduce the Antichrist and to consolidate or gather the nations of the world into one government and the head of that one government will be the Antichrist and he will lead a war against God which is exactly 
what the word of God prophesies it uh, in the book of Revelation. Between the throne of God and the earth, there is a layer called the second heaven, where the kingdom of darkness operates. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. But remember, where God is, there is light. But between the place where God is and the earth, where we are, there is spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. It says so in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So the layer of evil between the throne of God and the earth where we are casts a shadow upon the earth. That is why the Bible says, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, And we know that we are of God, and the whole earth lieth in wickedness. Another word for wickedness is darkness. Darkness covers the earth. Spiritual darkness, spiritual ignorance, and spiritual bondage is covering the entire earth. That is why David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Psalms chapter 23 and verse 4. The shadow of death is our emphasis here. Without a doubt, David was a prophet because David could see spiritual realities like the prophets. This spiritual darkness which covers the earth like a shadow is also a force, like an ocean of darkness. That is why in movies like Star Wars, they often said things like, may the force be with you. The force be with you. May the force be with you. May the force be with you. Anakin, may the force be with you. May the force be with you, master. May the force be with you both. May the force be with you, master. May the force be with you. 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 May the force be with us all. Obi-Wan, may the force be with you. Goodbye, old friend. May the force be with you. May the force be with you. Always. May the force be with you. May the force be with you. May the force be with you. And remember, the force will be with you. Always. May the force be with us. May the force be with you. May the force be with you. The force will be with you. Always. And may the force be with you. May the force be with you. Remember, the force will be with you. Always. The force is with you, young Skywalker. May the force be with you. May the force be with us. May the force be with you. And may the force be with us. May the force be with you. May, may the, the force, force be... <laughs> You've got what I've said it enough. May the force be with you. Always. This force is that ocean of darkness which can be manipulated and the process of manipulating the forces of darkness in exchange for man's selfish and short-sighted gain is called witchcraft and sorcery. The process of working witchcraft in an organized and well-educated manner is called Freemasonry or the Knights of Malta or the Jesuit Order, etc. These elite lost souls who work with Lucifer believe that this great darkness is light. So to them, darkness is light and true light, which is the word of God, is darkness. They are backward. These men oppose themselves. Man opposes himself. Without Jesus, man is on the gangway to self-destruction. That is why 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 25 says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Such is the power of this present darkness. It causes men to oppose themselves. This darkness can also enter into men in greater and greater quantities. You see, the physical portion of man relates with the physical world, but the spiritual portion of man relates with the spiritual world. 
The spiritual world rules over the physical world the same way a parent rules over their child. Man exists in both realms simultaneously. But remember, the spiritual realm that covers the earth is darkness. Your physical eyes cannot see this darkness, this spiritual darkness that covers the earth, but the evil that is done on the earth is the physical proof of its existence. And this darkness is compelling the human spirit to receive messages and think in a way that eventually results in him imprisoning himself and promotes darkness in the earth, sometimes without him knowing that he is promoting darkness and making himself a slave. Because humanity oftentimes cannot see far enough to understand the ultimate consequences of their actions. The prison of slavery and death that man forms in his mind as a result of the deception of darkness is called a stronghold. Most of humanity has no idea that spiritual darkness is manipulating and controlling the affairs of humanity while imprisoning them in strongholds of spiritual darkness. That is why Paul said in 2 Corinthians, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Strongholds are deceptions of darkness that imprison and enslave men by causing them to think in ways that promote darkness, corruption, evil, and sin in order to achieve their goals. In other words, the philosophy that some evil must be done in order to achieve good is a philosophy of darkness, which Jesus exposed in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 and verse 23. Jesus said, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye be evil, your whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? He meant that if your perspective of life is truth, then your life will be full of light and righteousness and integrity. But if your perspective of life is that evil is sometimes justified in order to bring about good, you will be full of evil because you do not take into account that evil you did in order to obtain good victimized innocent bystanders who are called collateral damage. If you think that corruption is the only path to success, your life will be full of corruption and you will leave a trail of collateral damage in your wake. And how great is that corruption? Proverbs 14 verse 12 again says, There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. But if you know and see the truth, the truth is a person, his name is Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, then you have discovered the path to eternal life that does not require compromise of integrity. The philosophy of darkness is order out of chaos, or evil can produce good. But that philosophy brings death and destruction. That is the fruit of the tree that Adam and Eve partook of in the garden. You see, God had set man to have dominion over the creation of God. But when man rebelled against God, creation rebelled against man. Creation then became subject to death and decay when God cursed the ground for man's sake. Genesis chapter 3 verse 17 and unto Adam he said, Because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Everything that comes from the ground is therefore subject to eventual death and decay, and the deep places of the earth also became the habitations of darkness, because the ground was cursed by God. The only way man was going to be able to survive physically was to farm, but spiritually man was going to need a strategy to regain his position in God. Jesus Christ is that strategy. So we do not ascribe to the philosophy of doing evil to get ahead. We trust in God, even though it looks foolish at first, but afterwards it proves to be a wiser decision because righteousness leads to eternal life eventually, while evil and wrongdoing brings death. 
Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 and 15. Do everything without murmuring or questioning the providence of God, so that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and guiltless, innocent and uncontaminated children of God without blemish in the midst of a morally crooked and spiritually perverted generation, among whom you are seen as bright lights, beacons shining out clearly in the world of darkness. Philippians 2 verse 14 and 15, the Amplified Version. One of the goals of this darkness is to introduce the Antichrist onto the world stage. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 38, Daniel prophesied about the Antichrist saying, But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. The God of forces is not necessarily Satan, or Moloch, or Jezebel, or the Queen of Heaven, or Baal, or Dagon. All of the religions of the world served those various gods, but the Antichrist does not honor those gods. Antichrist honors the God of forces. The God of forces is Apollyon, also known as Abaddon. Abaddon was a warrior angel in heaven. He is the only fallen angel whom Erica saw Satan speaking to with respect as an equal. Abaddon even shouted at Satan, and Satan responded calmly. You will find him in the ninth chapter of Revelation. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the pit. Verse 11, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. The Antichrist will honor Apollyon with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. In exchange, Apollyon gives him power to do damage on the earth, and he will slay humanity like no other man has ever done before him. The Antichrist is a deceiver and a sorcerer and a worker of witchcraft on a level that this world has never seen. Daniel 8.25 says, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. The craft that prospers in his hand is witchcraft. Another definition for witchcraft and sorcery is counterfeit spiritual authority. The primary method of exercising sorcery and witchcraft in an educated and organized manner, as we said before, is called Freemasonry. Freemasonry is the unspoken main religion of most of the governments of the world. Most of the political leaders that rise into positions of power do so through Freemasonry. Look around your city and see if you can find local Freemasonic lodges and the symbols like statues and monuments of Freemasonry through which they communicate to one another. One of their main symbols is the obelisk, a representation of the male genitalia. This symbol represents the breeding of the fallen angels with humanity in order to bring forth hybrid children who are not the children of God, but the children of darkness. This is called the mystery of iniquity. It is the Antichrist spirit, and it has been in the earth since before Cain killed his brother Abel. These symbols are in every city in every country around the world. There are also many pastors with huge churches and large congregations who are Freemasons, especially in the USA. Satan has cleverly filled the earth with his churches, posing as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And so we are going to be seeing Elon playing a central role, especially with his role in Neuralink. He wants to upload the minds, the brains of human beings to the cloud. He wants man's brain to be connected to the internet, to think Google. You, you won't have to type in Google anymore, you'll just think it. 
mankind is headed in the direction of cyborgs. And that is the image. That is one of the images of the beast, the image of the beast the causing all human beings, as it's written in Revelations 13, he causes all to worship the image of the beast. And what is the image of the beast? That he's going to become, that mankind is going to become a cyborg, a mixture of human and uh, artificial intelligence and technology, and something that is no longer in the image of God, but something that is more like the image of the beast. And anyone who refuses to upgrade will be killed. And this falls into climate change because these cyborgs or these beings, these human beings who have now merged with uh, technology or uh, and have become cyborgs, if you will, will now have less of a carbon footprint, will follow specific rules, will only eat so much. We probably won't be eating any more meat. And, and that will mean that less cows will be slaughtered and that supposedly that will contribute to um, you know, less of a carbon footprint and other things just like that. But there will be stringent rules that human beings are going to be following. And those stringent rules and policies is the image of the beast. We're going to be seeing artificial intelligence and climate change policies and financial and economic policies where every human being will take the mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And that will essentially turn them into the image of the beast and they will no longer have the image and the likeness of God, which is what God created Adam with in the beginning. And so that is how climate change will play a major role in the agenda of the Antichrist. And I'm not saying that climate change is false. No, it's real. However, it is being manipulated. There are people, there are players who are manipulating this in order to bring about the will of the Antichrist in the last days. And this is how climate change plays a role. Remember, Jesus loves you. We're at the end of the end here. This is like, for us who read the Bible, this is like a movie we've seen a thousand times. We're just watching this replay. We already know what is coming before it comes. But for those who might not know the Lord, this is your opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus Christ before it is too late. That perfect sinless sacrifice, his blood was shed on the cross for your sins so that you do not have to pay for your sins. A lot of people ask, why would a loving God send somebody to jail? And that's like asking, why would a loving judge send their own kid to jail or send their own son or daughter to jail if their son or daughter committed a crime? You see, the judge still loves their child. However, according to the law, if you break the law and your dad is the judge, your dad has to send you to jail. Otherwise, he also becomes a criminal. Well, God is not a criminal and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so for that reason, many go to hell, even though what God has done is that though we are all guilty, what God did was he went ahead. He wrote that we're guilty. Yes, but he went and paid the penalty for us on the cross and went to hell on our behalf so that we wouldn't have to. That's like having your criminal record expunged. You would have to be crazy to refuse a deal like that, especially if you know that you're guilty. Imagine a judge telling you in a court of law, you've been found guilty and you know you're guilty and you actually did it. And he says, yes, you're guilty, but somebody else has taken the punishment for you. You don't have to go to prison. Can you imagine what kind of life you would live after that? You would be very careful not to find yourself in that same predicament again. And that's why Jesus told the adulterous woman, go and sin no more. God has made several strategies available for mankind to push back the darkness away from his life. As we have previously stated, darkness covers the earth. But individuals can push back the darkness that surrounds them by the following strategies. Step one, you must be born again. 
John 3, 3, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When you are born again, your spirit man is reborn and birthed through the word of God. This reborn spirit can now receive direct communication from the Holy Spirit. Before you were born again, you mostly received messages from the darkness that covers the earth. This born again spirit can download messages and new dimensions from God, which make new possibilities available in the life of the believer. Similar to the way a smartphone can download applications, which open up new possibilities in the phone. Downloading new dimensions from God can open up new possibilities in your life. Step number two, the power of prayer. Prayer builds up the born again spirit man of the believer making it possible to increase in power and in capacity and in ability to download greater and greater dimensions from God. Prayer increases the light with which man shines because the power of God that man is able to wield is also increased. The Greek word for this power is kratos. It is the power that one builds up over time through a life of righteousness and consistent time spent in prayer. Ephesians 3.20 now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power kratos that works in us ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. now that power that works in us can be increased the same way an athlete works out and builds up strength by consistently going to the gym 1 corinthians 14 verse 4 says he that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself Prayer changes you and does many other things which we do not have time to get into on this broadcast, but power is one of the most important of them. Step number three, meditating on the word of God. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 29 says, Is not my word like as a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Any computer programmer can tell you that anything you see on the screen can be programmed to appear the way that they want it to appear. The way a programmer does this is through communicating to the computer through a code, which is a language that the computer recognizes. This code tells the computer what to do. The Word of God is also a powerful code. It can build you up and produce powerful results in your life. Acts 20 verse 32 says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The word of God is the code which was used to create the whole world. Therefore, that same word, that same code can create your world. Step number four, holiness and righteousness. Hebrews 12:14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness and righteousness ensures that God will hear your prayer and respond. In Psalms 84 verse 11, the Bible says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Step number five, charity and philanthropy. Proverbs 22, 9, He that has a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. In Matthew 19, 21, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that you have, and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. The poor are a portal through which a man can transfer wealth from the earth into heaven, where he will have laid up for himself treasures, and he will have been blessed upon the earth. The world of darkness believes that giving to the poor will make them poor, that taking from others is the way to make one rich. But the Word of God says that giving to others is the opportunity for greatness that demonstrates the goodness and the kindness and the generosity of God. The truth points man in the opposite direction from darkness. These are just a few of the strategies that heaven has put in place for your triumph in the earth. Principles like integrity, faith, Hope and love are the principles that can build a nation into the heights of achievement their governments long for. These are the principles upon which the kingdom of God is built in the hearts of men. The world may be dark, but we, the children of God, shine like stars in the firmament, and those that dwell in heaven are cheering us on as we move closer to the coming of the Lord. We have the upper hand. 
For those of you who would like to learn more about the financial principles of this world and how the kingdom of God delivers superior results, get results in your finances like so many other Christians who have read this book and applied the biblical principles hidden in its pages and become financially free. Read The Truth About Money, What Schools Do Not Teach About Money. The sudden collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and Credit Suisse is an important wake-up call to the whole world. This is no time not to understand how banks and money works. You need to read The Truth About Money. Learn how central banks operate. Learn how the commercial bank works. Learn how money works. Learn why schools do not teach about money. Learn how wealth is created and how you have been participating in the systems and cycles of poverty. And so this is your opportunity. I'd like to pray with you that you would receive the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins before it is too late. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes, it's over. He's taking no prisoners. Those who are on the right side will be with him. Those who are on the left side will be destroyed. And when he comes back, he is not the suffering lamb that he was when he came. He is the mighty conquering God. The book of Revelation describes him as he that treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, meaning he's coming to annihilate iniquity. And you don't want to be found on the wrong side of his judgment. So if you will, let's pray. Let's say, Father in heaven, I have heard your word. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I pray that you may forgive me of all my sins. I receive you in my heart, Lord Jesus. Wash and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Write my name in the book of life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And please teach me how I may live a holy life that is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' precious holy name, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are born again. I believe you need to begin to read your Bible ferociously, to learn the ways of God, to learn the things of God. Find a Bible-believing church, get involved, learn the Word of God, keep on feeding on the Word of God, control your atmosphere, and feed constantly on the Word of God continuously, and the Lord will be with you. May God bless you. From Bamboo and Mommy Erica, AKA Mama Maisha greets you. God bless you, we love you.